Good morning, this is Mr. Riley, and we're going. I'm going to lecture on Chapter 9 of CIST 2613. Let me go ahead. Hopefully you're seeing this. Okay, so we're going to talk about web and database attacks. So, classes of individuals interacting or concerned with web server. Who talks to a web server? Your server administration, administrator, your network administrator, because he sets up the connections for the servers, and then the end user who basically interacts with it to basically do day-to-day -day business, whether it's email, e-commerce, whatever. So uh, categories of risk, defects, and, misconfig and misconfiguration risks. So if you have an older version, if you misconfigured it, browser and network-based risk, browser or client-side risk. So, you know, if your clients are at risk, then it could possibly put the browser, you know, the browser being Chrome, Opera, Internet, well, not an Explorer, but Edge. So vulnerabilities of web servers, improper or poor web design, can sometimes observe sensitive items by viewing the source code of the page. So the web designers who designs the web page, if they do poor work there, then they can also give away information. So in here, you're looking at the source code, and you actually have addresses, and you could possibly see like database information. And right here, uh, input hidden price six thousand dollars where web designers use hidden fields to hold the price of an item well if you go in there and you change their web their html code from six thousand to sixty you can make a good discount on that some other vulnerabilities of web servers buffer overflow denial of service attacks distributed denial of service attacks getting banner information from it if the Permissions aren't set right, error messages. Sometimes that gives away information. Unnecessary features installed. If they have additional user accounts, use with it. And if you're talking to a database through that, you could possibly do an SQL injection. So with a buffer overflow, buffer overflows occurs when an application or process or program attempts to put more data in the buffer than it was designed to hold. So if you set it up for the buffer to hold 40 characters for a last name, and you type in something larger. You can actually put in special characters that will trick it also. A programmer, either through lazy coding or other practices, creates a buffer in the code that does not put restrictions on it. If you put more in there, it should give you an error and says, no, we can only accept this much. But if the, the code, the programmer doesn't do that, then it leaves itself open. Like too much water poured into an ice cube tray, the data must go somewhere, in which case it means adjacent buffers. Can result in corrupted, overwritten data, loss of system integrity, or disclosure of information to unauthorized parties. A DOS attack is like a one-on-one -on -one where you're attacking a server. Uh, an attack which all web servers resources are rapidly consumed, slowing the performance of the server. This is mostly an annoyance. Now, DOS, denial of service, it's one-on-one, -on -one, so they can block that pretty easy if they have a good intrusion detection system. Uh, DDoS is coming from multiple sources, so you, it's harder to block. Accomplishes the same goal as DOS. The difference is scale. Many more systems are used to attack, crushing it under the weight of multiple requests. I read an article about a denial of service attack on a DNS website, and... At one time, they were receiving 1.5 terabits of data at one time, you know, continuous like attack on them. So it basically shut them down for about 10 minutes. Uh, some examples, ping flood, you know, keep sending pings. Smurf attack, that's where, and I think we're going to talk about each one, sync flooding and IPM fragmentation attack. Uh, ping flooding, basically that's where you hit them with a whole bunch of pings. Smurf attack is where I spoof my address and send out a ping to everybody and they reply. But with my spoofed address, I actually put the person I want to attack's address so they reply to them, not me. 
send multiple synchronizations like the three-way handshake syncs, but never reply to them. And then fragmentation is you send corrupt packets and it tries to crash it. Banner information about a web server connects to the port 80 and a web server to receive web, web server's information. When a client and a web server talk, they pass information back and forth. What language are you talking in? What type of keyboard are you using? What, how fast you want to talk? Do you want to use encryption? And so you can actually glean information about this. What OS are you using? Are you using an Apple? Are you using Linux? Are you using Windows? So they have to know how to communicate. Permissions, control access to the server and its content can be incorrectly configured. Incorrectly assigned permissions have the potential to allow access to locations on a web server that should not be allowed. Older web servers allowed access to the directory to directory traversal by default. The attacker could enter a path such as, you know, slash, 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 Etsy, some, someone file, and have access to some directories. It's basically a web server is just another data, uh, not, a, not a database, but a, a file structure built just like, you know, whether it's Windows or Linux, but it has paths and all that. So you need to make sure the permissions are correct. Error messages could be potentially vulnerability to give vital information to an attacker. Okay, so say you get an error message from a server. You can look at these error messages and see possibly what type of machine you're talking to. So they have that old, you know, 404. cannot be reached, so access denied, executable de access denied, read access denied. So, okay, what type of machine are we talking about? They're using SSL, so. Unnecessary features, servers should be purpose-built to roll which they fill in an organization. So if you have a web server, don't run other things on it. Have it be a web server. Anything not essential to this role should be eliminated. Hardening removes this feature, services, and applications that are not necessary for a system to do its appointed job. If a feature or service is not needed, it should be disabled or better yet, uninstalled. So uninstall it. If it's disabled, then it has a possibility of maybe through a virus or something be re-enabled. But if it's uninstalled, it's not in there to begin with. User accounts have what you need, what users can access these web servers, you know, like Regular users can have read access, but I mean, like for configuring them and all that, make sure you have a limited number of people and also turn off unneeded accounts. Most OSs come pre-configured with user accounts and groups already defined and in place. These accounts can easily be discovered through research by an attacker. If you know anything about Microsoft, for instance, when you install a new feature, it usually adds groups to support those features. That's one of the places a hacker may want to throw one of their, you know, accounts into so they get access. Security best practices, disable or remove default accounts, create new ones that correspond to how the administrator will use the service. SQL injections, designed to exploit holes in the web application, attack injects SQL code to input into the input box, form or network packet. Um, SWL commands can exploit non-validated input vulnerabilities. So if they don't validate the input, used to execute arbitrary SQL co commons through the web apps. So examining SQL ejection. If a website lacks input validation, that means it checks the data you input before it processes it because it doesn't want to get garbage. Only a web browser and SQL knowledge are needed to launch an attack. SQL injection attack is a common and serious issue with websites that use a database at the back end. So a lot of times when you talk to a web server, you're not talking to the database, you're talking to the web server, which talks to the database in the back end, like if you're talking to Amazon or something like that, because they will, you know, you're talking to the web server and then it'll send the data back to the, uh, the back end server, the, S the database server. It's carried out by placing special characters into an existing SQL command and modifying the behavior to achieve desired results. So in the following example, after, attack, after an attacker with the username Kurt inputs a string name, delete from items for the item name, the query becomes the two following queries. Select 
wildcard from items where owner is Kurt and the item name is name. Delete from items. So he's actually deleting stuff. If an attacker enters the string name, delete from items, select from where A equals A. Well, A will always equal A. So select from owner Kurt, item name is name, where anything from the items where A equals A, it'll list all the items for you. So you're getting information out of there, and then you can copy that away. But instead of using items, use stuff like credit card numbers. Cross-site scripting attack. An attacker discovers the HR rule website suffers from cross-site scripting defect. An attacker sends an email stating that the victim has just been awarded a prize. So they're spoofing them, and they click on it. The link in the email goes to HR rule com name. And basically, you have a script. So when the user clicks on the link, the website displays, welcome back, John, Bill, you know, Susan, with a prompt to enter their name. The website has the name of your browser via the link in the email. When the link was the link was clicked in the email, the HRule website was told was told your name. The web server reports the name and returns it to the victim's browser, echoes it back. The browser correct correctly interprets the script and runs it. The script instructs the browser to send a cookie containing some information to the attacker system, which it does. So, and that's where you know it's enabling cookies on your machine. Uh, anatomy of web apps with exploitive behavior, theft of information such as credit card sensitive data, the ability to update applications and site content so you could change your website, server side scripting exploits, you could do buffer overflows, DNS attacks where you can actually redirect where DNS translates the user of uh, the host name to the IP address, or you could actually destroy data if you'd like. Anatomy of web apps, um, categories of web application vulnerabilities, authentication issues. How do they do their authentication to let you in there? Authorization, authorization configurations. What are you allowed to do once you get in? What are you authorized to do? How long are the session management issues? How do they handle sessions? Do they just destroy your session token once you leave the session, which they should, because that way someone else can't grab it. Do they do input validation? Do they have strong enough encryption? Is it implemented? Environment specific problems. So like if you're in a third world country or something like that. So insecure logon services exam of re examine of revealing error message. The user is not active, contact your administrator. So if you get this type of message, you can actually say, oh, okay, so this was the correct name, but it's not active. Track the information related to the improper or incorrect user logons. Enter, enter an invalid user ID with a valid password. Enter a valid user ID with an invalid password. Enter both, you know, both invalid user ID and password. And what type of, they should all get the same message. Wrong, 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 you know. Uh, scripting errors. Upload bombing, poison null attack, script, default scripts, sample scripts, and poorly written questionable scripts. So, I want to show you this. Upload bombing, upload bombing uploads masses of files to a server. The goal is filling up the hard drive on the server, basically choking it. Poison null attack passes special characters that, that the script may not be designed to properly handle. Actually, if, um, you know, the uh, actually, if you use like character map, you can find special characters that it can't handle. Default scripts that are uploaded by servers by web designers who do not know that they do a fundamental to do it at a fundamental level. In such cases, an attacker can analyze it and exploit configuration issues with scripts and gain unauthorized access. So you may want to remove those or. Sample scripts, web applications may include sample content and scripts that are regularly left in place on servers. These scripts may be used by an attacker to carry out mischief. And poorly written or questionable scripts, basically check your scripts before you write them. Uh, session management issues represents connection that a client has with the server app. 
assessing information, giving attacker access to confidential, confidential information. So a session will have a unique identifier or encryption and other parameters. But that session should destroy itself once you're done, once you break, break that connection. So some of the vulnerabilities, long live sessions, you know, you can set the timers on that. Log out features. Sessions that between the client and server should remain valid only for the length as needed, and the discarded sessions should remain valid for a period longer than they are needed will allow attackers to grab onto that session, such as cross-site scripting to retrieve session identifiers. Uh, logout features, basically, they log you out for inactivity after a few minutes. Insecure or weak session identifiers, something that's easily guessed. Granting session IDs to unauthorized users. They need to be authenticated and authorized. Apps or inadequate password change controls. Those need to be, you know, mandate password changes. Inclusion of unprotected information in cookies. Encryption, encryption weaknesses. Weak ciphers, use short keys or poorly designed implement. Allows attacker to decrypt data easily and gain unauthorized access. And vulnerable software, software implementations such as secure socket layer may have poor programming. That's why SSL has pretty much been replaced by transport layer security. Database vulnerabilities contains info about the site or application. Holy grail of attackers. If they can compromise the database, they can get all kinds of information. Username, uh, user, I mean like consumer accounts, maybe uh, credit card data, configuration info, application data, and other data. So different types of databases. You have the relational database. Data can be organized and accessed to fit the scenario. Data is stored in a collection of tables and accessed through a query. And that would be like at SQL. The non-relational or no SQL database, common in different varieties, key value is stored as popular. The no SQL data stores, HADOP, and Cassandra grew from the need to store and retrieve large volumes of data in a short period of time. So their basic structure is different and for different uses. Some of the database vulnerabilities, if they're misconfigured, if your database manager has lack of training, buffer overflows if there's no input validation, if they forgot to uninstall options, and any other oversights you might see. How do you locate a database on a network? Network database scanners effective as locating a rogue or unknown database installations. Uh, SQL recon, similar to network database scanner, these are actually tools for Microsoft SQL installs. An OS scanner or O scanner for Oracle installations, depends on what type, because Oracle's big with the database community, SQL. So if you want to search for databases on your network because they actually use certain port numbers and all that so they can actually kind of sniff those out okay and this shows like a database uh, scanner in use network database scanner what ip address it is da database server password cracker so say once you find one how are you going to crack into it Password cracking tools, you can SQL ping three. Kane enable, which has been replaced by John or John Johnny the Ripper. And dictionary, dictionary based cracking methods. Because that's how you do, you break into them and that's, that's like they said, the holy grail of information. Locating vulnerabilities in databases, common, vulnerab common vulnerabilities include you, you stored procedures, Service account privileges in use, where, where or poor authentication methods enabled, or no or limited audit settings. And that comes to misconfiguration. So, and you can actually research a lot of these on the internet. Out of sight, out of mind. Learn the security features in the database system. Evaluate the use of non-standard ports. So, what this this slide's about is keep your database out of sight. So instead of using your standard ports that I was talking about, you know, sniffing out, these non-standard ports. Update it. Run the updates. Get your security updates. 
Make sure your OS is secure along with it and make sure to use a firewall. Cloud computing, cloud services, platform as a service, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, some of the security issues. Will you have availability to it? You have to encrypt your data, go, reliability. Will it be available? when? And when you move it into somebody else's facility, you tend to lose control. So you got to keep those in mind if you want to move it up to the cloud. Okay, and that should finish that up. Thank you.